So I'll give you uh, a 10 minute warning at, at 12 15. Yeah, I probably. Will. Oh, wow, we're there already. Interesting. All right, so welcome to Starter Studio. Love to see the big group. Everybody wants to show up to see you today, Michael. So I hope yeah. you got your shit together. Um, so this is Starter Studio. I won't go through the whole song and dance I always do, but it's a three-month accelerator program. We've got six startups that office right over here, uh, and you can find more information about those startups uh, on our website, starterstudio.com. You can go to our meetup, which is where you find out all the information, where most likely you found out this even existed today which is uh, meetup.com forward slash starter dash studio. Uh, up and coming this week, what you're a part of right now is a brown bag lunch. That's 12 to 1 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The whole goal is to uh, get equipped with you know actual uh, tangible things and tips and ticks, uh, tricks that you can apply to your own startup starting today. Uh, so today's with Mike. Where uh, Thursday is actually yours truly. Uh, my my uh, <coughs> startup, I was in the first starter studio class uh, and so I've kind of been going through a lot of pitch decks presenting around town. So I'm going to do kind of like a case study re, uh, deconstruction of Showflow's pitch deck. Uh, so if you want to learn any tips and tricks and ninja moves on pitch decks come Thursday. And then next Monday, just a heads up, is our founders talk, which is uh, last night we had Sean Seffler with Clean This World. Awesome, really cool story. We are all, we're getting all of our talks online, or at least a majority of them. It's taking us a little bit of time, but we've got a routine now, so they are making them up to our YouTube channel. Uh, so look for them there. You can find Sean's there by the end of this week. Uh, next Monday, we have uh, Wayman Armstrong, uh, 7 p.m. right in here. Uh, and so uh, awesome founders talks are pretty amazing. Uh, speaking of today, though, polishing your pitch with Michael Judith. If you look here, his slide basically talks to all the crazy things he's been a part of. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> it looks like just business diarrhea up here on the screen. But, oh, that's uh, a good way to describe <laughs> it. <laughs> he's been uh, held executive positions in Fortune 500 companies, worked with successful entrepreneurs, a big uh, part of the Starter Studio program in the first class, and just kind of uh, comes in as both a mentor and uh, office hours on a lot of different fronts. Uh, and specifically, he'll tell you this, and he just mentioned this to me out in the hallway, uh, last week alone, he reviewed and, and saw 92 pitch decks. So he's no stranger to pitch decks and what he believes is and is not a good formula for that. So uh, without further ado, put your hands together for Michael. I walk around a lot. I'm gonna try and get this in a more. Perfect, okay. Okay, before we finish today, make sure somebody remind me at the end of this. I want to give you a little trick that you can apply for sales in Orlando that's very unique to Orlando. We've, we have opportunities here that you can't really find anyplace else in the world. And before, it's, it, it's actually doesn't even fit into the subject matter, but it's something that's kind of fun, and I've shared it with people before. And it really, you know, it helps to know. And, and to me, the most important part of any startup is sales. I mean, you could talk about marketing, branding, and everything else, but at the end of the day, you've got to get sales. I actually live by the mantra, um, there's no problem that more sales won't solve. And if sales are your problem, then that's a good problem to have. So anyway, as Steven said, these are just a few, believe it or not, of the startups that I've been involved with, with skin in the game and frontline operations involvement. And <clears throat> in the case of the ones I put up here, uh, each one of these pictures, each individual picture is a whole different type of enterprise. And some of them, we were just way too early. I'll give you an example. The one in the middle there, that's a brew pub, Golden Gate Brewery, uh, Berkeley, outside the front door of Berkeley, California. Now those things are really in vogue. Don't I wish I still owned it? But we don't. That was done in 1988. Yeah. So, that was a good year what? That was a good year too. Yeah, it was a good year, absolutely. And we did what we did. We, we started it up, and what our model was at the time is we'd start something up, we'd bring in management, we'd bring in passionate entrepreneurs like yourself, and we'd sell out to them, and then we'd move on to do other things around the world. But anyway, um, 
all kinds of different things from power plants to magic themed restaurants. And currently this year, I'm actually uh, just like, every, uh, like the starters in this group, I'm a starter this year. I've started a couple companies and I, I'm, I'm thinking out, I'm, what I'm basically doing now is taking basic research out of the universities and collaborating with NASA and looking three to five years out and trying to solve some hard problems that I think will have industri in the industrial base throughout the country. So I'm not really worried about tomorrow. I'm worried about the three to five years. I want to take stuff that I know where hard problems that have been solved in space can be applied here on, on the planet Earth. So um, today's talk is about putting together a pitch deck. As Stephen says, I've seen more than my share of pitch decks. I've created them and I've had to listen to them where people you know, are trying to sell. I do a lot of work around the state with all kinds of different organizations and stuff, uh, coaching, mentoring, as well as working with VCs and cap, uh, uh, private equity, um, trying to put together uh, deals. Um, how many were here for Carol Ann's talk? Okay, the starters were, and George. <laughs> Um, when Carol Ann Dykes talked, and she talked about the elevator pitch, one of the key things she said was, you're not really pitching. It's a boomerang. You want it to come back to you. You want to entice people to listen to what you've had to say, and then you want them to engage with you. And that's, I think, that was the first time I'd ever heard it put that way. But that's why I put the uh, boomerang up there. And I didn't just pick any boomerang, because I personally I've had the experience and, and, and the opportunities to travel all around the world, so I've studied a lot of different cultures and religions, and I believe in karma. I believe uh, this uh, speaks into exactly what Nathan talked about when he was talking about how to slice the pie. You need to be good to people, and we're going to get to that a little further on, um, because it can all come back. And in my case, I've got a few years behind me, these gray hairs, not one of them is because of my children. It has to do with that whatever Stephen called it, collage I had previously, um, and dealing with people. Single biggest, hardest problem in any enterprise is dealing with the, uh, the people. So in terms of putting together the uh, pitch deck, the biggest animal in the room is the fact that we're all petrified to talk in front of people. Research shows that you'd rather die. And this is a true story. They've done studies. The number one fear is the type, see the heads are shaking. The number one fear people have. So you have to get past that. And if you can't, if you have to give a pitch and you can't, then you've got to hire somebody. Believe it or not, here in Orlando, we have a lot of actors and actresses that do just that. When the trade shows come into town, they go out and they do the pitch. They give the whole presentation. They've never even heard it before. The companies aren't really good at articulating it and they do it for them. There's a whole industry around that here in Orlando. But that is the key to anything, is getting over it. Now, the reason I bring this up, and I bring it up right now, is because how many of you are in here just saying, I want to see this guy fail. I want to see him say something stupid. I want to see him make a mistake. Somebody raise your hand. Come on, Stephen. I knew Stephen and George would come. Absolutely. I have precog. I knew they were going to come up with that. The truth of the matter is, everybody has a fear of public speaking. The truth, though, is, most people in the audience are rooting for you. They're sitting there thinking about what it would be like if, if they were doing it. And Nick's shaking his head. Nick's a Toastmasters <laughs> uh, general. Um, they sh you know, they're sitting there si and engaging you and hoping to learn from you and, and get that information. At the same time, they know how it would, tough it would be for them. And so they empathize with you. They're not trying to criticize you. <clears throat> So these are a few things to consider when you're trying to design your pitch deck. Uh, first of all, your two most important slides are the first slide and it's the very last slide. And why do I say this? Well, when you all came into the room, my collage was up there and you sat there for how long? And you're looking at it and somebody in the room, was anybody kind of interested in what that was or trying to figure out why it was there or you know, who is this guy all of a sudden? It gives you time to think about what's going to happen or what might be presented. Now, if I were pitching or if I were trying to sell a product, I have nothing to sell you all. But all I wanted to do is give you a visual bio of who I am. 
and other than this corporate person that might have you know, been involved in this company or that, or the fact is actually my, my real background is in engineering and nuclear reactor theory where I had a whole history and career at, which I want to apply going into the next 10 to 20 years. I want to apply. Uh, so anyway, the purpose of that slide was to give you as much information and get you thinking about what it is I want you to do. At the end, the same thing, the last slide, I'm going to be sitting here answering Q&As and there's going to be information up there. Um, in the case of a product or sales or I want you to see my website, that's what would be up there. Again, I forgot even to bring business cards. I have nothing to sell you, so this isn't your typical this is about doing a pitch and not giving a pitch. Steve's going to do the pitch for you later in the week. Um, another thing, it's important that you share a story, a very compelling story, and try and keep it simple. Stories are more interesting than facts. Uh, and so if you can make it personal, something that people can relate to, how it involves them in their lives, uh, how your product or whatever it is you're trying to communicate um, and they can empathize with you, you get your point across much easier and much better. You should always know your audience in advance. Now I know today, and specifically I'm here because of these, uh, these, uh, the young starters in this uh, class, and to me, there's a really, really, you know, there's a war going on, and it's a war of attrition of entrepreneurial spirit in America right now. And anybody that's, and if you, the numbers back it up. You don't even want me to start getting into the numbers. But uh, anybody that's willing to step out and uh, take responsibility, uh, respect others, and go into the marketplace with integrity and bring new products and services to the market, it's the, it's the exact thing we need the most right now in our economy and in the world. And uh, America typically uh, takes leadership in that. Um, you always want to speak from the heart. You always want to be sincere. You always want to have conviction. You want to you wanna believe in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, you're never going to get anybody else to believe in you. Uh, additionally, and this kind of uh, goes back to what uh, Carol Ann was saying, communication is a two-way street. Now, at the end of this, we'll have a Q&A, and most importantly, you know, I have, as I said, nothing here to sell, so you're free to ask me anything you want. Anyway, I can give back to you. That's what I'm here for. Uh, I live by the mantra. I, I heard this a long time ago. I like it a lot. It's, when, you know, when you're young, you learn. When you're in your 40s, you earn. And when you get to 50s, and I don't want to tell you how old I am, just had a birthday, uh, you just uh, return. You know, you give back. Hmm? Um, and what's nice is when you get people like Greg and Steven and all the other people that come out to Starter Studio, uh, George is a big one. He go, I, I see him out at the university to, to give, and on all the startup weekends, so giving the community and taking their experiences. And there's nothing more valuable. Uh, the founder talked last night, unfortunately I miss it, but I've heard him before. I can only imagine it was fantastic. Next Monday night, you really want to come if you can make a, a founder's uh, talk. Uh, we have a research park here, all kinds of neat things going on in it all the time, and he feeds into that. It's amazing uh, the kind of companies that can be started and, and nurtured and grown right here in Central Florida with the support that we have. Um, oh, I'm a big advocate of uh, having, you know, big text, uh, try and keep things simple. A good visual is worth a thousand words. Uh, when you see a picture, although my first picture was a little busy, I could walk you through each one of the pictures and, and, and tell you little brief snippets and then expand upon story after story and war story and the fun stuff about it and the bad stuff about it. Um, uh, the, the guys at Freakonomics did a study and they found, in the, and this is in their second book right now, um, that the single most difficult three words for anybody to say is, I don't know. And you should never be afraid to say that. In fact, I realize now as I get older, um, I really don't know. You don't know what the world is going to grasp onto. 
uh, whether it's Beanie Babies or the iPhones or the Android. You can only throw this stuff out and hope that it sticks. And then if it doesn't, you know, we feed into that uh, overused word of you pivot. Because if you have a brand or if you have a company like Apple, they can, they, the big companies can move around this stuff all day long. In fact, on that very point, um, how many people in the room have heard of Kaiser Permanente, the uh, insurance company, the health insurance company? Yeah, a lot of people. How many people in here know how Kaiser began and how they made their money in the beginning? Actually, even further back than that. During World War II, Henry Kaiser would launch a, a liberty ship every single day at noon a commercial liberty ship every day at noon, industrial based, and now they're an insurance company. That's how they've gone. They, they obviously pivoted a little bit along the way. Um, but as I was saying, if, if you don't know, it's not a big deal in your pitch to turn around and say, you know, I'll find out the answer. That shows that your willingness to get the truth and not just throw nonsense up there. Um, when you create your pitch deck, one of the things at least I really believe in strongly and, and what I'm really trying to work hard with in the enterprises I want to start going forward is to create alignment and have it such that my financial partners, my technology partners, and my business partners, and they all have the same goal in mind. We're not fighting each other. And I was talking to Chris earlier, who's a starter from one of the previous classes, and he's actually fallen right into that kind of flow right now with his startup, with a company out in California. It doesn't get any better if, if your customers and all your strategic partners have the same goals, aspirations, and, and dreams that you have. I think probably Greg's probably experienced that a lot in, in, in the work that he's done. Uh, Anybody here know the story of how Google ended up with Android and the whole operating system? Because it's a great story of alignment, and it's a great story about pitch decks. There's this, there was this guy in this small team of uh, programmers back in 2003, a guy named Andy Rubin. And they came up with the idea because of all the GPS and stuff that actually was being embedded in cell phones at the time, that it would make sense to get that into the operating system. So they came up with the concept of Android. Well, when they first came up with that concept, they thought to themselves, well, Google's really taken off. Now, if we're smart, if they endorse us, if they endorse us, well, that'll help us. We'll be able to go, we'll either sell the operating system or we'll at least be able to get uh, uh, ubiquity and get some self companies to sign up with us. So they go in to pitch Google on endorsing them and walked out with a $50 million check. Now that was in 2005 when they talked to Google. They started in 2003 and it wasn't until 2007 in, when Google launched it and pushed it out. So this whole process of being a startup, we all have good ideas and we all know they're just gonna monetize overnight, right? Well, there's a cardinal rule. Your expenses are always twice as big as you think they are. Your revenue's always gonna be half of what you think it's gonna be and come in tw twice as long as you ever expected it to. You've gotta have patience. And so you've gotta be able to communicate your story and you have to have endurance for that story. And finally, Nathan talked about this too in slicing pie, depending on if you have worker bees or if you actually have grunts that are involved and then are, are a piece of the cake. You want to have integrity because if you start out and you're young and you blow that, you give it up in, the, uh, in a five minute thing or one deal that, you know, to bail yourself out. When you're older like me and you go through some of the stuff I've had to deal with in my life, and, and you probably would all say, well, that would be fun. Yeah, well, let me tell you something. Some of it's fun, some of it's uh, beyond comprehension. Um, it's nice to know who you can really trust. And as long as you've maintained your personal integrity throughout, you've got those people, they'll always be there and they'll always show up for you. 
So it's, it's important to maintain that integrity, and those, that integrity will show up in the slides in the way that you pitch yourself on an ongoing basis. That's part of that whole boomerang pro process that comes back to you. And you want to play nice, because even if you had a bad experience with somebody, and I've had my share, boy, I had one startup, I had one of the craziest partners I could ever imagine, and I ended up returning to my investors 400% on their money. So, you know, and to this day, I haven't shunned that person, even though he was, I mean, totally certifiable. You just want to play, uh, play nice. Okay, so now getting to exactly the rules, and, and I've got it down as a 10, 18, 30. The foundation for this is actually, uh, the genesis is from a guy named Guy Kawasaki. Who knows Guy? Yeah, everybody knows Guy, great, because he's really good. He's good at the sizzle part. And at the end, I've got some other stuff. But his is actually 10, 20, 30. Anybody know why I chose 18 instead and what the 18 stands for? The 10 stands for there's 10 important slides. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I've laid them out the slides. We're going to talk about them. Um, the 18, a TED Talk maximum length is 18 minutes. They've done all kinds of studies. You've got these PhDs of the world trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. The average length, evidently, of a coffee break is 18 minutes. And so people will watch it, and then it can go viral. So in, in Guy's case, he says, you know, and it's true. Most people get bored. I'm probably boring you guys right now. Um, but most people get bored after about 20 minutes. Finally, the 30 is the size of the font. You want big fonts. I don't know how many times, in fact, all last week, you know, these itsy bitsy fonts with advanced, you know, calculations and everything. You want it big. When you're delivering your pitch deck, you're, you can't get all the information out there. You're enticing people to come up to you, talk to you, to engage you. You're not going to sell them. You're not going to close them. It would be very rare. I mean, in fact, anybody that's ever done any kind of seed funding or financing knows that if a VC or an angel really gets involved, the, the due diligence goes on and on, and you know, there's this whole courting period, and then, then you get to, and, and then the lawyers get involved. And that's, you know, that extends things even a little bit more. So the 10 key slides. The first slide is the problem and the products and what I would call the wow slide. And I used it up today giving you a visual bio of myself, or at least why I was here other than some corporate jerk. Um, this particular slide I actually put up here because I thought Stephen would want an example, <laughs> is a slide that I used with uh, a group uh, about a year ago. I was out uh, at the Space Coast helping, literally, it was a group of eight people and five of them were rocket scientists. And they had a product, and this, their product was to actually solve this particular problem where you see these bridges and these buildings falling down. So, and believe it or not, they are now, we've been able to get them set up. They've got funding, they're incorporated. I got a VC that has total, a lot of interest in them. And they've got a company that can use their product in an innovative way that's in alignment and they're working to move forward. Um, the reason that particular slide, I like it so much is, you know, it obviously tells you what the problem is. And in it, it also talks about a 2.2 trillion, boy, talk about an eye opener, I never thought. Corrosion was a 2.2 trillion annual uh, problem in the world. A uh, lot of low hanging fruit in that. You don't have to score a lot of customers. So that, uh, this is actually was the genesis of that. So, boy, if there's stuff like that, maybe there's other things in the labs that might have just as much uh, economic uh, uh, balance and impact uh, here on Earth. Um, the reason it's in yellow because I think this is uh, the three most important slides here, the first and the last, like I told you already earlier. The one in the middle is in yellow, why your team's the right team, because other th everything else, it gets down to it. Ideas are a dime a dozen. People and execution is so important, so important. Uh, George and I were having a talk earlier, and. If you get something, you engage it, you think you're on the right path, you've got to run real fast. You've got to run real fast, you've got to be able to be mobile, and you've got to be able to close. And you've got to have a great team to do that, and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, the second slide I believe you need is right after you identify the problem, you tell people, 
how you're going to solve it, how you're going to solve it now. And again, th this can be monitored and tweaked based on whether you're trying to sell somebody or whether or not you're trying to actually raise capital. So, and in, in a lot of cases, the two are the same. Um, because as I said, ideally you want alignment with your customers and your, your strategic partners and, and your finance people. Uh, you want to give your value-added technology or your edge, and you've really, in today's world, you, 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 it's got to be something special. You got to work really hard, and uh, I think Greg and, and Steven and everybody that's brought in the starters have identified the, the seeds of that in all the starters that are in here and where it goes from there. I mean, here we've got these guys that have remarkable princesses in their, uh, <laughs> in their games. I mean, it's phenomenal. We've got a person that knows how to blog. God only knows what's going to happen with this talk because she's here. I mean, I might have exposure I never had before. So you take these seeds and it's out of those seeds and it's that value add or that technology that you can bring that's special that you're trying to let people, both your customer and or your investors, know that you have. Obviously, why you have the right team is so important. It's great, oh, I've got this idea, but how are you going to execute? I mean, when you really get into it, when you start to grow, when you go, when you go uh, parabolic like a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft, there's so much more. I can't even, just with what I'm doing now, the amount of legal work that I have to deal with is mind-boggling because I'm dealing with tech transfer offices all around the world and all this, and creating these collaborative agreements. So there's a lot of stuff, having all the right team and team people that you can trust to be empowered to do their job so that you don't have to do their job. All the way down to having the right person that can deliver the pitch. If you can't do it, the first person you need to hire is a salesperson that can deliver the pitch. And you need to address the competition, and don't tell me you don't have competition. Uh, and I'm going to use the, our robot person. Where's our robot? There he is. He may not have competition. He's got this neat little robot, and it's doing all this stuff with the iPhone, and it's as good as it gets. Nobody else may be doing that. But if no other reason, every other toy on the market is part of his competition. Because he's got to attract the parents and say, why do you want to spend on this instead of that? And when it comes to toys, there's a heck of a lot of them. So if you're ever trying to pitch money and you get up there and you say you don't know who your competition is or you don't have any, you're going to lose them real quick because they know better. They know there's somebody out there gunning for you. Okay. Then you get it. To me, I always like to see sales, marketing, and branding, but most importantly, how are you going to sell? Sell, sell, sell. That's what As a startup, and John Riley brought all this up, and, and, he, and he did a, a real good job of it. Um, he kept uh, harping on the fact you need to be out there. You need to be in front of people. I mean, today we want to just use technology, and that's great. And if you can close with technology, you can close with the phone. I worked for Merrill Lynch for a while. I know what it is to close a nice number on the phone. I, I got some lady that said she never would buy anything over the phone when I was with Merrill Lynch in the 80s. And I sold her $500,000 worth of mutual fund and bonds and over the phone. So people do do that, but it's very rare. It's very, very rare. And if you get them that way, you can lose them just as quick. It's that whole B2B process it's, that's it's creating and out there pounding the street, getting into and uh, uh, in front of who the real customers are and who the leveraged customers are. Uh, one slide should be de dedicated to your business model, and I'm not talking business plan, I'm talking you know, business model. Business model is basically how you're going to create, uh, capture, and deliver into society or into the ecosystem that's something that's special. You know, how are you going to do that? Uh, what's your process and, and, and what's unique about it? You always want to have a, a sheet in there that has financial milestones and projections. You want to, ideally, if you're lucky and if you're looking for money, you've got a little history that you can show and how that if you get the money, you can leverage that up. That's what, the easiest way to get money is not needed. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but you get somebody and they say, oh, look at this. He's doing this great. He's doing it locally. How can I take this and do it all around the world? And so I'll throw a couple million bucks at it. 
In fact, I was with my nephew last week, and he just had a growth spurt. He's got, he, got some big, he does augmented reality, and he just, got, he's just went through a growth spurt of, from 35 employees to 115 employees. So he's got serious financial backing because I can, I can promise you with that kind of growth, I, I, I'd be surprised if his revenues are matching it, but they might be. I mean, I don't know. I didn't dig into his uh, financials. Um, you want a slide that will manage expectations and manage expectations realistically, telling the status of where you are currently and where you're going to be in the future. Um, and you want to do it realistically. And if you end up taking somebody's money, and at some point during the process, you start to fall behind those expectations, the quicker you communicate it, the better. Back to the whole boomerang thing. These people are partners. The last thing you want to do is dig a big hole and then tell your financial partners. You always want to get the bad news out as quick as possible. Keep it up there. Keep them abreast. Ask them how they can, you know, Tell them the problem, have them share in the solution. I mean, I said it earlier, the world is about people and working together and putting these teams together that can do extraordinary things, and that's how you get an Apple and a Google. It's not about, oh, I'm going to do this on my own. It used to be, but that's not the world we live in anymore. In fact, any idea we were to throw out in this room today could be executed on in India tomorrow just because they might have picked up the YouTube that we're talking about. So it's a whole different world and you've got to, uh, you've got to be really nimble. You want a uh, strong call to the action or the ask at the end of this, uh, at the end of it. Now that might mean, can you help me find new customers? Everybody in this room, I need customers. Well, I don't need customers, but you know, or I need money. Or because if I get some of your money, the way I can get your money back to you is by leveraging this up because we do this so well locally. I know if I roll this out in 52 states across the country, we're going to be the next Microsoft. Um, but whatever it is, your last slide, and then it sits there when you go into the QA period. So whatever it is, you want to make sure it has, you know, a lot of interesting meaning and information uh, in it. Maybe if it's just your contact information, if, that, if that's what you think is all important. So, I've got a success, uh, I, every, every lunch alert I've been to, everybody asks for a reading list, so I planned on it ahead of time. <laughs> I've got four books up here. Uh, for this group, if you haven't read it, it's the easiest read is Guy Kawasaki's uh, Enchantment, The Art of Changing Hearts. But I would strongly suggest if you only read one book, it's the hardest book up there to read, and I would read Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. It's an old, it's been around for years, it's in a second edition, and it just goes to the heart of things. Power of Habit, unbelievable and uh, it's a great book it it's it's the mainstay it talks to the proctors and gambles of the world and how they do the things that they do and get you to do the things they want you to do um, and then you could actually in terms of Simon's uh, start with why there's a great TED talk you can go up and watch and save yourself the price of the book um, as far as I want to give you this one little quote as starters, and I wanted to share this quote with our starters, more importantly. And the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. <laughs> there, is, there is a whole, um, there's been a whole study done out there. In fact, uh, when asking a lot of, uh, they did a whole study on high school students and they asked them, what do you want to be, what do you want to study in college, and what do you want to be when you get out of college? And the number one answer was famous. <laughs> you laugh, but think about it. We think there's, uh, there's been studies done and there's a whole, literally 72% of the people aren't even engaged. And that's why I literally take my hats off to the starters in the startup studio and to Greg for supporting these people and for everybody else that supports them. Because 72% of the people just want to show up, get a paycheck, and go home and wait for the government to raise the minimum wage. I mean, 
that's the world we live in, we've created it. Well, in that same environment, um, you've got, like I said, you, uh, senior moment here, senior moment. So we'll just stop. I want to go on to the last slide for you. And I want to talk a little bit about something we have in Central Florida that I haven't seen anywhere else in the world as well done as it's done here. And they talk about it in, in San Francisco, but I've been out there in the last few weeks and have been having a lot of conversations. It's more of a click. But what we have is a real commitment in this community. And, and I, I've literally done uh, on-site studies of over 30 countries and worked all around the country. We have an ongoing commitment in Central Florida to help the small business start. In fact, um, a majority of all small businesses is just one or two people. But we have the tool sets. And I wanted to bring this slide to everybody's attention as we go into the Q&A, because even for the starters, after Starter Studio and they go on, these are invaluable resources and everything up here is free. It's community based. If you haven't seen what they, they've got something like 50 or 30 or some, God, this is just a short list of the, the free providers at the National Entrepreneurial Center. University of Central Florida, their incubator program and all the different things they have at the university are open to be used and engaged. Take advantage of it. I mean, there's so many people that want to help you succeed. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You've got the Venture Lab. If you've got a tech-based uh, venture, they'll literally dig into it for you and help you figure out how you can, uh, what your market is. Um, we've got the Grow Florida, the Florida High Tech Corridor. I was even surprised to find out, and I wanted to share, in case you didn't know, you can go to the Orange County Library. If you have a library card, you can have free 3D printing. You got to pay for the materials, I think. And what happened there is I was working with an incubator. Uh, I was uh, judging an incubator uh, pitch contest here at the university, and one lady said, oh, all I need is $10,000 because that's what my prototype's going to cost. It was like, stop. Go to the library, get your prototype made, and get back to work. <laughs> Save yourself $10,000. Um, so with that said, are there any questions? And that was longer than 18 minutes. <laughs> yeah? Excuse me? Oh, yeah, I can make them available. Yeah, I'll send them to him. There's no problem. Anybody else? Oh, see, that's good. Yeah? Talk about that idea of how to sell. There's money available when you, when you don't need it. Right. So, at, at the pitch deck, for example, for, for our demo day, how, is, how do you frame that question? Do you order it there or do you set it up for a later action? Are you. Uh,